we've just had quite uh, interesting scenarios. Astrida, I will uh, first of all uh, talk to you. You are representative of science. Um, can we uh, draw up such scenarios about uh, farmers? Because agriculture is a very conservative field of uh, industry in Lithuania. Well, we can draw up different scenarios, uh, the changes, uh, global change, uh, changes, uh, blurring the the um, uh, line, what is traditional and what is um, uh, not. Uh, global processes and global markets uh, um, and events change the global face and change the agriculture. And there are lots of um, uh, poor people, uh, malnourished, but also quite a lot of obese people. So we have to speak not uh, how to produce more food, but how to produce enough food in the places that it is needed. So here, I think not only traditional foodstuffs uh, play a very important role, but the position of the farmer is transforming. And we're talking now about farmers and businessmen, and the businessmen are also farmers and vice versa. So these processes are happening and they will happen and the new functions of farmers will emerge, new business models. And if we were talking about uh, a few years ago about robots, uh, that was a fascinating thing. Now, agriculture is the most uh, uh, automated sector and we have lots of robots. Sometimes um, it is fascinating to hear that farmers should process uh, their products but we don't we're not telling the construction company to produce raw materials for them farmers have to do what they uh, have to do um, and what they can do uh, sometimes maybe produce uh, food and speak about vertical farming and uh, urban farming this is our future and we as a science institution we speak about new professions because uh, we ne need to transform our perception and uh, now we speak about the fact that a person has to have IT um, knowledge and we are speaking about uh, digitalization and agriculture. This is here and now and this changes modern future agriculture. We speak about uh, influences and also the those who are different and work in agriculture. Thank you very much, Secretary General. We also spoke that education is the backbone for transformation um, of food supply chain. And I would like to address, to address Mr. Victoras. You as a politician, policy shaper, former, what is a sustainable food chain? What are we transforming? We have to come back to what the UN is saying about sustainable food. Is food secured for everyone? We're talking about sustainable chains in order to secure food, but they have to be of high quality. We have to speak about both things. They would like to um, uh, just uh, uh, agree with uh, colleague Astrid that we have to speak about sustainability uh, from what we use so we can produce what we need. So uh, nobody, I think, said no to eating meat but uh, during lunch, but, uh, and we talked about how can we replace meat in the morning and make uh, the food supply chains more sustainable, reduce methane and so on and so forth. We have to ensure sustainability from changing our approach starting from maybe schools, high schools. We're talking about food waste a lot. Uh, and uh, let me make another introduction. Uh, the previous speaker say, said nicely that 
people will need to change and farms will need to uh, to change. But in Lithuania, up to 15% of farms produce 80% of products. And this is our reality. Those who play with farms and would not uh, profit, they will not have a big farm. And this is a law of economy. Your main activity, if it sustains you, then you are interested and successful in that area. But if this is only a game, a secondary to you, um, to, just to satisfy your need, this is not uh, your main thing. So let us agree that uh, uh, the the land will feed us, um, will and people who will work the land, they will be responsible for many things. But we are the ones who are, are contractors and consumers of the producer. So everything starts from consumers, education of the consumers. And now I will address Andrus. So you, as food producer, uh, from whom do you receive for your orders? Well, today we need to create orders ourselves because, as Victoria said, I would say that uh, it's not uh, just from the part of con consumers, but also from the part of society. It's not clear what is uh, this sustainability. Each of us have our own definition. Some think about uh, sustainability in terms of uh, environmental friendliness. Others have other notions in mind. So this is a problem. Many businesses now have sustainability policies. One has three bullet points and it is sustainable already. Another one has 33 bullet points and it is also sustainable. And uh, as I uh, like to say, uh, legal firms are most environmentally friendly because they don't pollute. So without uh, sustainability in terms of ISO standards, we, don't, we will not know what it is. Now we have uh, a range of opinions as to what it is. So we as producers, we are one of the largest producers in the Baltics in uh, wheat and milk. So we understand sustainability as efficiency in production. And as our colleague said, uh, we do everything in terms of digitalization, smart fertilizing. Uh, we have uh, analyzed soil and uh, we put fertilizers uh, uh, where they are needed and the types that are needed and we are going to robotize uh, the area even more. But this is for the bigger ones. But in terms of uh, technological progress, it is taking place. But looking to the future, it is not yet clear. And uh, that is why sometimes we have different understandings as to what this sustainable farm is. We say organic farm, and we as a European Union want to produce 30 or 40 produce organically, but it is much more expensive. It uh, uh, wears down the soil. Of course, I'm in favor of green economy, but in reality, looking practically, probably that would be going back uh, to uh, the 19th century village when it was really bad for the farmers. So logics must be applied everywhere. And we still miss this logic and we need discussions in order to understand these logics and to have as many organic farmers as needed. So, of course, uh, there's no doubt that we have to engage in organic farming where it is uh, needed, but uh, we don't have uh, electronic tractors now, for instance. We cooperate with uh, New Holland and others, but nobody has them. And uh, some have uh, e-tractors who that can uh, tract uh, larger trawlers, and they... Uh, 
lose uh, power very quickly. So we need technological progress. Thank you. So I have the same question. What is uh, sustainable agriculture or agricultural system? And uh, Mr. Prinskedis, well, sustainability is food. Incidentally, yesterday, there was uh, a holy mass celebrated at the gate of dawn, and um, the priest uh, said, uh, expressed uh, the best wishes to farmers and uh, spoke about the very first profession in the world. Of course, these are not uh, liberal professions, but it was agriculture, the production of food. And uh, I greatly respect uh, Professor Victoras uh, and agronomy. It was the very first profession in the world. But uh, that was because it is related to food. Food is sustainability. Sustainability means that we have something to eat. And it, it is consumer who shapes uh, this area. In 99%, uh, consumers make orders to us, and 1% of farmers produce not what they want. We have to understand that they produce uh, what consumers want to eat, and that's how they earn, and this is sustainability. And here we are speaking about transformation. And I have uh, many visions of transformation. Let me enumerate just three of them. For one, the world is changing, and the consumer, I have just happened to come back from an international conference. So there was an international conference in Portugal on uh, husbandry, and consumers are starting to change their habits. Uh, a third of uh, the population cannot uh, drink milk, they cannot use dairy products, and they are starting using artificial milk. It's not just that people don't want eating meat, but they don't want slaughtering. They associate meat with slaughtering. Therefore, eating habits change. So we must understand that the basis of consumption is not big, and we have to catch up. After COVID, all the markets, all the chains have been changing drastically. And uh, I have been thinking probably we will need to engage in insect production, insect growing, uh, not for human consumption, but in terms of feed for pigs and uh, birds. We must understand that the world has been changing, changing. Our market is not big. We are an exporting country. We are exporting six times more as compared to eating ourselves. Uh, we're not going to see famine here. Forget about it. Africa is another thing. So progress is taking place, and these artificial products, we are speaking cautiously about them today, but meat, milk, eggs uh, do not comply with equality standards in terms of artificially produced uh, products because meat lacks uh, iron, uh, other products lack amino acids, but in several years' time, uh, the technological progress is going to catch up. It was mentioned today that uh, it is impossible to distinguish between artificial and original cheese. So let us not forget that Lithuania is recognized as a green country producing quality food, not just quality and healthy food, but uh, our neighboring country said that it is tasty food. Uh, and we still haven't said that we are producing uh, a healthy, organic and tasty uh, food. We still need to think about other technologies as well, such as insects, uh, lab-grown food. You have a laboratory, so please produce. Uh, take raw materials and produce. This is uh, one for one in terms of transformation. Another thing related to transformation is related to uh, new technologies and innovation. We have precision innovations where we need to introduce a lot of new things. Hundreds of millions are allocated for the modernization of farms. And uh, I told to the Irish uh, where we are investing in, and they said, no, farmers are buying that themselves. So we need education 
and we still uh, uh, do not uh, finance research. We need to fin finance them more. We need to finance universities and researchers because this is going to be important uh, for the next uh, 10, 50 years. And Ireland is a very advanced country compared to Lithuania. I have also happened to be in Ljubljana in Slovenia. I sat in a cafe with a farmer with a hundred cows farm. And there was just one person working on that farm using a computer. Robos, robotics uh, is milking those cars, uh, uh, cleaning, and uh, that's it. And this one person is just monitoring everything uh, in uh, in his computer software. Everything is virtual. A signal is given to the cows where they need to go. There are no even fences. Everything is virtual. So there's a mass of technologies that we don't use. And for us, the work in the farm seems to be difficult, while it is not difficult in that farm. I can speak a lot, but uh, let me uh, say a couple of words about small farms. We will move towards a stable, resilient family farm. And as it was mentioned, in the crisis situations, this farm was mostly resilient because it had the least impact on the labor force. While the labor force is a critical matter, as Andrews mentioned, Robotics is going to work in family farms as well. There's going to be two, three members of family who will supervise uh, two, three hundreds of milking cows, and that is how it is going to be. We're not going to have cheap labor force anymore. Ukrainians are not going to come here to work cheaply. We need to look for innovative new means facilitating the work of farmers. And uh, this uh, average in Ireland, uh, 30, 60 cows, this is a family business. Slovenian maximum cow farm is 100 uh, cows because uh, with uh, the farm growing, taxes are also growing and uh, there is a certain ceiling. Uh, they cannot uh, receive um, financial support anymore. The customers will not want to finance them. So the vision will be towards a stable, average uh, family farm. Two people ensuring sustainability and survivability. Of course, we will need to look for new things, uh, cooperation, search for markets, research, and a number of other things that we need to discuss. But here we would need uh, the Ministry of Agriculture sitting here and taking notes so that they understand where billions need to be allocated. And I hope we will engage in this discussion. And uh, there are a lot of uh, transformational things. As Matty said, there are a lot of things that need to be used. So all forms are possible in our agriculture in the future. Let me address rockers. You represent a large international corporation. Just recently, uh, there was uh, an international forum of ministers of agriculture from 150 countries in the world in Paris. I have happened to read a declaration of that conference. And uh, the leaders of those countries uh, accused uh, uh, the agricultural system. But we at Business at OECD, we are the institutional stakeholder to the OECD. And uh, one of the key message in the ministerial, agriculture ministerial that just took place a couple of weeks ago was that there needs to be a very clear role for public-private partnerships because without the inclusion of the private sector in the dialogue and the discussion, we will not achieve any neither uh, immediate, medium, and, and long-term goals. And that is exactly why Business at OSD was created 60 years ago. Uh, in addition, OECD is a standard-setting organization. They mainly are doing political economic uh, recommendations, suggest domestic reform agendas, but they, are reali they realized immediately when they were created in 1961 that most of their political recommendations are impacting businesses on the field and on the ground. So they really need to have a stakeholder at the table, hence the role of business at OECD. We represent all OECD countries and beyond around 
60, close to 60 leading major business organizations and confederations. So a Lithuanian member is the Lithuanian Confederation of Industrialists uh, and also as well sectoral international uh, business organizations, associations. Through them, businesses and the private sector have a chance to participate to OECD internal meetings, see every OECD report that you see being publicized. For example, the OECD FAO Agricultural Outlook, that's a very influential public publication released every year. We and the private sector has the chance to view, review the first draft, second draft, third draft, and provide its input as little as specific language uh, edits or even introducing a best case examples, case studies of how private sector are actually implementing the solutions that governments are asking how to do them. In particular, through our cooperation with the OECD, we have the, the seat at the table, so in a, as in a typical international organization, and in the min meeting of the ministers a couple of weeks ago, there's one seat for each delegation and there's one equal seat to the private sector. So we have the chance to be there, we have the chance to share our best practices, the private sector can tell directly governments, not only to their national government, but talk to other government representatives across businesses as well, what are the key challenges that we're currently facing, and then the OECD can act upon it because as an institutional stakeholder, OECD has a role to listen to us and take everything that we say into consideration into their everyday work stream and into major publications like the declaration. And indeed, what is missing and what the ministerial declaration and ministers a couple of weeks ago said is we need to have more private sector dialogue, more inclusion of the private sector in these dialogues and one of the ways to do it is to be there, to listen, to talk. And uh, OECD is sometimes, uh, particularly in European countries, not perceived as much as the place to, to, to participate because there's a lot of focus on the European institutions. But the European Union usually participates to OECD meetings at the same level as other national governments. So OECD is a standard setting organization where we can create these standards. And what Andres exactly said is that different companies have different goals. So you need to have a forum where to decide what exactly is the standard that we all need to adhere to. And the OCD is a perfect place and every business is, uh, has a chance to participate in these discussions. So you mean that it is possible to engage in that discussion and each business has a possibility to provide their vision of sustainability, right? Yes. Thank you, Rokas. Mati. To everyone say, now maybe you could comment a little, what's in your opinion would be the biggest impact, what are those factors that would move uh, towards changing or transformation, which you are saying it, it won't be easy? Yeah, uh, so I think, I think uh, the, the discussion was very interesting and I would start with the point of, of the kind of uh, public-private uh, uh, partnerships and working together on, on the standards. Uh, because uh, indeed, if you look into the future, and here I'll draw just two very crude scenarios that we have looked at. One is, of course, further uh, consolidation of the food sector. And then you have food supply chains where, as a farmer, you basically have nothing to say what sustainability is because the processing company and or the retailer will tell you exactly what they want and you will have no question about it. But with many of the changes uh, and technological changes also, you actually see the food supply chain actually becoming a food supply network. So we now have with the new logistics and with the changing logistics, you know, we have the boxes company that actually, and all the direct to consumer uh, possibilities that are arriving. We've heard in one of the earlier session also the idea that, uh, that yes, uh, somebody would like, like in Brussels, just to go on a bike somewhere outside and get fresh product from a farmer and, and so on. So all these models are potentially available uh, and will be more available in the future. So it's a question of kind of taking that into, into consideration. And in the same sense, so I have to relate to the uh, issue of organics. Uh, it's, it's very important that, that farmers do at least consider what are the costs and opportunities of changing, not maybe 100% of their production, but start experimenting with different production. And I think the key word that I wanted to say for the transformation is experimentation. 
and, and uh, it will be difficult, and there is no smooth path, as I said, but if there is an open field for experimentation on part of the field, on uh, you know, a common, common space or, or some other way, where there is a beginning of, of uh, also a dialogue between the scientists, the farmer, mm -hmm. and uh, the processor, for example, this is where we will actually see something emerging. Some of these will be terrible, and uh, there will be bad examples and so on. But some of these will succeed, and, and I think that if, if we are to do a transformation, we will need to be Build, uh, on, uh, on this. So uh, technology, as also we were saying, opens up some possibilities which uh, we do not believe in uh, right now, for example. So I was talking about the kind of non-monetary aspects uh, of farming. But of course, with uh, blockchain, you, create, you can create new currencies. You can create new forms of exchanges uh, around tokens, around different values. So you can imagine actually these farms being uh, in new terms of a completely different economy, profitable, even though in the normal monetary terms you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, think so. so. So all this is possible. Now what will actually happen and what will be the combination of the different models is something that is really up to us, and this is what we say in Foresight. So, so basically there are many futures possible and we have to know the diversity of possibilities and, and try to strive to one or another direction. So I hope that answers a bit your question. Yeah, thank you, Maciek, so much. I think we are kind of on the way with this uh, experimentation. If we are looking at the large pilot projects, uh, different implementations, demonstrating of the technologies on, uh, on the farms and etc. cetera. Um, but Norecio Grishti prea... But let me come back to the cooperation. It has been mentioned several times already, and it was said that uh, public and private sector should closely cooperate in this uh, transformation. So, Professor Victorias, you as a policy shaper, what do you think? What is the main engine for this transformation? Who should give impetus for it? Politicians or businesses? We shouldn't distinguish between uh, politicians, uh, businesses, and producers into separate groups. I believe that our constant work together brings us toward good results. Let me tell you an example. Our cur current sittings of the Agricultural Committee of the Parliament in Lithuania take place uh, remotely, and it is the result of COVID. And um, there are from 80 to 150 people participating, and everybody has the right to express their say. If they uh, agree or object to some decisions, the decisions don't come from nowhere. They come to us either from the European policy and now we are looking back at the environmentally friendly solutions and I believe that any solution can be discussed widely and publicly and then it brings transformation in our policy and it has this wide agreement from the general society and it is society itself who needs these solutions so we need to speak about sustainability of this sector as well we need to speak about sustainability of food production the war has shown that uh, Africa uh, experienced uh, lack of food so we need to make uh, uh, supply chains sustainable, not just in terms of environment. Let us go back to Ukraine and Lithuania. We have different requirements in our two countries, and uh, it is difficult uh, for us to compete. So we also need to discuss about these things. If we are going to the international market, our agreements in Lithuania should also comply with the um, international market conditions. Now, let me give a question to Astrida. Science, research plays an important role in this dialogue as well. 
We spoke about the fact that we need to produce different types of food. We need to change habits. But who is shaping this? It is professionally presented arguments with uh, statistical data, uh, figures, uh, and uh, science and evidence-based arguments about the benefits of one or other types of foods, about the benefits of the um, organic farming, about sustainable value chains. So scientists and researchers are unbiased. They uh, base their arguments uh, by scientific research, and science is highly important here. On the other hand, why do we use certain products? It is also related to professional marketing, professionally manufactured products, and the society accepts this professional uh, manner. Now, if we speak about uh, separate groups, producers, consumers, it is high time that we start uh, working uh, in terms of engaging innovation system, both science and innovation organization, non-profit organization should be engaged. So we are, we have to prepare this knowledge and innovation system that would be beneficial for everybody, not just for farmers, but that there could be feedback to the general society as well, so that scientists would say that one or another type of innovation is good, that one or another type of solution is not acceptable. So in this case, scientific institutions are one of the most important constituent parts of this uh, process, and that's how it should be. On the other hand, we are training a new generation which is going to engage in agriculture and who are also new consumers with their new habits and new opportunities. So here, it is also very important. Well, we talked a number of times that the consumer is the reference point that we start from. And let me now um, address Andrews. High quality food, uh, you said uh, organic, not necessarily better. But then, in your opinion, where should we start from? What is quality, what is good or bad quality food? Well, I wouldn't say bad or good. Uh, uh, it is good as long as our veterinary service is not against uh, uh, to consume it. But um, yes, uh, your question is a very relevant one. Well, uh, we also have to speak about the risk. And in this uh, political dialogue, the dialogue between researchers, producers, and politicians, the highest risk is for those who produce food. Because at the end of the day, they either place it on the market and or they have no chances of doing that. And we have lots of examples, not very good examples, when we had different fashionable trends of food uh, stuffs and they collapsed. In Lithuania, there was this cannabis uh, trend and we thought we'll be, be the, higher, the biggest producer and it was a fiasco. Two companies went bankrupt and uh, that was the end. So unfortunately, these things also happen. At the moment, uh, we have a bubble of uh, the so-called uh, uh, plant-based meat. And lots of companies are going bankrupt. We represented the first and the biggest UK company of plant-based uh, uh, meat in Lithuania and Scandinavia. We had to stop the sales because nobody is buying it. This uh, flag ship beyond the meat, uh, uh, the most successful one, uh, uh, reduced the capitalization 10 times in one year. And they dismissed uh, the, um, the second or third director general. It is fashionable, but it does not sell. Is it healthier to uh, eat uh, soya-based isolate uh, brought from some 2,000 kilometers? But the, the meat, everything has to be logical and uh, thought of. 
I agree with Mr. Pranskietis, the biggest sustainability is to have affordable food. If we have niche products, special, super, extra names that we don't understand, this is not necessarily sustainable if people can't afford it. And we have lots of examples like that. Lots of trends and fashions and initiatives of uh, insect-based food. Uh, some five years ago, I visited uh, a startup uh, in France uh, with an investment of 130 million, and they went bankrupt now because even with robots, they couldn't even make a feed. Uh, they could not compete with rapeseed or uh, um, oil and so on and so forth. But it did not happen. The, there are risks in the production uh, chain. And be it a big or small producer, they all face the risk. And everything has to be balanced. Our desire and uh, so, so the so-called uh, going towards this future. We don't know what the future will hold. If we think about uh, food, in the last 10,000 10, years, it didn't change. Grain, cereal, vegetables, fruit, uh, um, also meat and fish. Uh, we have some snacks, some, some different beverages, but nothing has changed. So nobody knows how the future will, will, will look like. You were very correct in saying that there is a question from the, the, of the audience whether we imagine in Lithuania that we could have genetically modified food, plant-based meat, and so on and so forth. So, so as regards a plant-based meat, uh, this is, uh, it is in crisis globally, this sector. It will be. It will be implemented, but whether it will take 6 or 70 percent of the market, there is a big question in that. Maybe 10, 15, well, I was in a food fair, and Israeli company is like printing meat, literally printing with a printer. They are not even telling the, the price, but it's a, it's a cool thing, genetically modified uh, and hormone um, use in uh, animal husbandry is something which is um, a decisive line between the U.S. and EU. Uh, because uh, the U.S. agreed everything on transportation, but Europe cannot accept, um, you know, uh, genetically modified products. Because the only way, if you want to... Uh, um, say no to uh, and uh, to plant uh, protection uh, or propagation materials. We have to understand that genetically modified could be the future. What about the farmers? You started the discussion about uh, technologies and also said that Lithuania is famous uh, uh, as uh, a producer of high quality food. Would we see uh, uh, our uh, farmers um, maybe I will continue this discussion that science is the basis, the backbone. We see lots of risks, lots of unknown uh, and uh, people experiment uh, and uh, see the market, there are ups and downs. Um, the Uppsala University. All the models are funded by the state to assess the risk. Uh, the robot, uh, green or black came and they have to, but somebody has to assess what is good and what is not. We tell our neighbor, or, uh, but science has to be something that can help the technologies. And uh, people say that the amount of your uh, uh, farm is that big or not 
but science has to come and then the transformation has to uh, has to follow mm. well to, to have 200 uh, um, beehives is is good but uh, you might be allergic to that uh, lots of uh, businesses are uh, profit making but you need to uh, base yourself on uh, um, science in Lithuania we are very segmented we um, we uh, put things we build things um, but we need to base ourselves on science and we can only talk during uh, this such for us uh, to drive us to the future well we export cereal uh, and we lose some two billion or three billion because of the uh, we don't um, uh, generate or create VAT. We are happy to export, but maybe we could get more seven billion, uh, and we could uh, some somehow uh, put them in the Lithuanian budget. Uh, we have to communicate with businesses uh, mr pranskietis uh, was very um, right in his insight uh, that uh, uh, gdp dynamics uh, will increase and uh, it it was ensured by it sector and agriculture so this is what we're talking about. Yes, this is a very progressive thing. Maybe we shouldn't be achieving for 18 uh, percent. This is in our hands and such organizations could make big breakthroughs. Agro-food sector should become um, a priority one. And this is what we're missing. Rokas, what trends? Uh, are there OECD is the organization where the first decisions how to change how to transform start this was like a backbone um, maybe there are certain um, signs of the decisions that transform us and to on how to do that on global scale and the way forward is what has been said here is science-based solutions mm -hmm. and decisions and that we don't have to look at transformative challenges without looking at it from the scientific approach as well. But apart from that, uh, what our businesses are advocating and what the OCD is partially agreeing with is that we firstly have to close the product, uh, sustainably close the productivity gap between developing and developed world. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a great example, and I think it applies across policy, not not even in agriculture, uh, such as in on the environmental performances. We have country of Suriname who's carbon neutral, but that's not really contributing to the global uh, global SDG targets. Same in agriculture. We have countries who are underinvested, who are not implementing the the solutions that are available or could be available to them. We're not going to ensure global food security in a more global sense. But in addition, we have to look uh, a lot and use data and uh, new digital technologies to uh, to align agricultural goals with global productivity global sustainable productivity growth and that has to do has to do with the cooperation between the private and the private and the public sector OCD is working a lot on that and across policy the, the digital committee is working on a new recommendation which is a, a soft law tool of of the OCD on how 
government can use and access data held by the private sector. And uh, agriculture sector has a lot of data that can be used and could be used to measure what kind of productive and targeted subsidies and, and trade facilitating measures can governments provide. But if the private sector feels reluctant or doesn't want to give up the data or has a lot of data that could be collected but is not, that we're not really in tandem in achieving the goals that we achieve to. And lastly, I think what our businesses have been always advocating for open market, but in particular, there are a lot of, and through COVID, we also saw a lot of uh, distortive subsidies from governments, and we have to have targeted measure, measures that uh, are science-based exactly, that facilitate trade and uh, to avoid disruptive trade uh, restrictions, tariff and non-tariff barriers, to make sure that trade facilitation can ensure the functioning of global food value chains. And we indeed are going towards the, the policies that are working from farm to fork, as was said this morning. Thank you very much. Now I will address the audience. Maybe you have a comment or question. Zita Varanavicene. Unfortunately, we can't hear without the microphone. Interpreters cannot hear without the microphone. I would like to uh, remind to you that Joint Research Center was one of the uh, institutions that uh, carried out impact assessment from farm to fork, and it was ignored uh, by the European Commission. So the question is to you whether the politicians are uh, brave enough to see the figures, because figures never lie. and. Uh, Sometimes they uh, are the ones that break our sandcastles and utopias. Are you brave enough to face the, the figures? Uh, yeah, but I think in a way it's a, it's a question for, for everyone. Uh, so um, I've uh, especially said the evidence-informed policymaking because uh, as much as science is the backbone of the policymaking, it clearly, in the end, it is the will of the people and it is the kind of democratic process that uh, guides this. Now, we want good evidence to be a basis of that guidance and a basis of the discussion that we have, we have in, in, in the democracy. Uh, so, um, so basically, uh, we want to make sure that the data is there, that it's available, but we also want to make sure that people make the, the, um, the kind of, the, the most reasoned uh, uh, kind of decisions uh, based on this. But it's clear that the decisions in a democratic process take place uh, elsewhere. I hope that the bravery uh, should come and it shouldn't only come from, uh, from sort of saying, oh yes, there's this one report and it says this, we need to do this. But it actually, I think it should come from the, uh, from the communication um, of, of, the, of, of the data. And I think this is where we're going a bit. So not putting just the report, oh, well, this is what will happen, but to actually imagine the different futures in which some of the aspects uh, emerge as stronger and some uh, as weaker will actually uh, help us entertain kind of the, the uh, different options. So in the end, the political choice is always to kind of to make sure there is a balance between the tradition and uh, what is changing. But I think we, we uh, and with the JRC report, I think we, what we're trying to do better, basically, to make sure that people take it into account, is to actually also make people imagine what do those numbers mean. Imagine what uh, can change. Because I think there was a, a very good point uh, that, yes, you cannot change on your own. So you cannot read in a paper that there is demand for bio-based uh, meat and start producing it. It has to be a decision that is made across the supply chain. You have to know that there is a market. You have to know and trust someone to buy it and, and, and so on. And this is how transformation happens. It doesn't happen as at, from one point as, uh, as with anything. So at home, we don't make decisions suddenly you know, to stop meat and then we think, well, it will change everything. Of course, if everybody buys in and if everything else changes, then this makes sense, but not this one, this one change. But it doesn't also mean that if, you know, it's not a restrictive aspect that, uh, that uh, well, I won't change because 
clearly nothing else around me changes. So it's really in these conversations and in these new networks, as we heard at the first session, that, that things are, are starting to change. And so, uh, so the bravery um, should not really come only from, from kind of going against the, the, the uh, old order, but actually to being able to point out what is already happening and start uh, building on this. And I think this is the strategy that, that we would want to implement, to show people, well, you know, they are changing, they are changing, and these are changing. And building on this, you can actually imagine a future that in some aspects are different. So, so yes, yes, thank I hope, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, Magic, we are out of time. But I hope it was the last question uh, from Lietuvos Žemės Ūkio Bendrovio Asociacijos President. From the President uh, of the uh, Agriculture Association. Well, I'll just, it's a, a comment. I belong to the a generation that implemented the program of uh, uh, supply uh, of the USSR program, supply of food. You know how it ended. Now I take part in the implementation of the uh, Green Deal. And I was surprised by Mr. Rokas, who for the first time was very clear in saying that we need to increase the productivity which is in the EU Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, Article 39. Nobody or not changed those objectives in the treaty. Increasing uh, uh, the productivity with the technical progress uh, has never been revoked. I looked into farm into uh, from farm to fork biodiversity strategies, and unfortunately, I found nowhere that we need to increase the productivity. Yes, from pesticides to fertilizers, we are too dependent on on that, and productivity is too dependent. But this is a positive dependence. The more fertilizers, the more the more yield we have. As regards the last communication with regard to the affordability of fertilizers, um, one uh, pre in the preamble. They say that because the fertilizers are not affordable for third countries, 22 million from 53 countries are now on the verge of the lack of food. It is fourth of those who starve. Okay, let us take the biodiversity restoration strategy, 50% uh, to reduce pesticides, 15% uh, fertilizers, but this will impact the, the productivity. Also, we have uh, minus 12%, and I will end soon. Other surveys say minus 10, minus 20%. USDA said that prices will increase plus 17%. The uh, European Commission also say uh, today that uh, uh, every percentage point in terms of price increase is ten, uh, tens of thousands of starving. And nobody reacted to that in uh, COP 25 or 6 or 7 in Glasgow. Uh, there, were there were organizations who take care of this uh, food supply. They said that food crisis uh, started back in 2015. Nobody reacted. And only the current events made it more harsher. So we need to come back to the roots that are in the EU treaties. Uh, and uh, they were uh, actually the will of our citizens, increase the productivity based on science. Before, and, and as long as those treaties are not amended, we cannot revise them. Thank you very much for your comment. I'm really sorry, but uh, I would like to ask to say the very final sentence, final word, and today I'm asking the same thing. What could be practical actions uh, th uh, towards this transformation? Well, there is no way but to discuss, exchange your opinions, and to hear the others. And Aruna said that uh, universities also uh, conduct uh, in-depth research that help assess the risks. Um, 
and that would be a very practical action because the farmers need practical things. They need practical markets and the market deals with everything. So we need practical support. Mr. Victoros, we have the aims, the goals, conditions and the opportunities. And all the conditions not related to agriculture should be in line with the interests. So the ultimate result is good. Our colleague said that sometimes the measures we discuss do not achieve the objective. So we need to discuss with the producers so the result is uh, yield. Mrs. Rita, well, I wish to everyone of you so the challenges are turned into opportunities and to focus on scientists and science, on the objective approach and better cooperation to all of us. Thank you very much. Our farmers want stability so they can work uh, in a stable way. They would need to have a vision and a strategy for three or four years and not the ones that change every uh, day um, and we see new challenges. So the farmers ask us uh, to ensure productivity, uh, the, the cost uh, uh, that is not increasing and that they can work with purpose. So we, they could uh, produce food, which is the beginning and the end of the world. To, to react to the comment that was made, we, the main question the OCD is asking as a global institution is how to raise productivity in a sustainable way. And, to, and as a business, our, our key message is, is how to close the productivity gap between developing and developed world and to use innovation and digitalization to make sure it is being closed in a sustainable way. And overall, I think and we believe that agriculture is going to be one, the one of the sector that, will be with, that we will witness the biggest digital transformation. It's not going to be any it's a cross policy work and this is where we have to invest and focus on and how to all together come to these solutions actual way and final sentence thank you very much very shortly on this uh, i think the transformation is not really only about us doing this but it will have to happen because uh, we've been discussing a lot of things about stability, but the world we're going into is the world of the polycrisis, of actually, you know, you can have one, one measure for, for uh, fertilizers for one particular issue, but if you have to have this measure every year, because there will be crisis every year connected to climate change, connected to geopolitics, uh, then you have to brace for a kind of completely uh, different approach. And, and, the, and the transformation is not something that was, and the European Green Deal, something that was dreamed of in search of a better world, but really in saving the remains of the world that we have uh, right now. And I think so the transformation will be much more forced than, than we expect, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you to the uh, discussion participants, and it was very important. Thank you very much for your comments.